We need to prepare for the possibility of no Christmas. Hello everyone and welcome back to Backlot Banter. My name is Tiger Hazel. Today I am joined by the absolute reddest boy that I've ever met in my entire life, Tanner Dykstra. And today we're here to talk about Red One, the biggest movie of the year, budget-wise it actually might be. Uh, but we'll have to do some research on that down the line. Uh, but a movie that we have been eagerly anticipating. And Tanner, we're here to talk about it. But of course, if you, viewer, have seen this movie and want to talk to us about it, you can join our Discord We you can talk to it uh, talk to us about it directly. It's a direct line. Like they have a direct mm -hmm. line to Santa Claus in this movie. That's right. You know, no, there's no, there's no operator that you need to go no. through or anything like that. You don't need to connect us. Yeah, I, uh, I, we're right there. We've yet to hire a secretary. That's coming. That's right. <laughs> Tanner, That's coming though. That's coming. How do you feel about Red One, my good friend? <sighs> Tucker. There was a discussion uh, we were having uh, some some weeks ago. Where I was like, oh, I'm absolutely dreading some different movie. I was like, it's probably my most dreaded movie of the year. I think it was Lion Mufasa. Mufasa yeah, yeah, yeah. was like, oh, my most dreaded movie of the year. I'm like, no, wait. Red One is my most dreaded movie of the year. Because we have shackled ourselves to see every large uh, notable release yeah. that comes Willingly, out every week. I will say. Willingly. And Red One, sitting in the theater. It's a Stockholm Syndrome film, sort of thing. We like yeah, it. Yeah, was <laughs> there were long stretches of time where I was like, I could walk out right now and be so much yeah, happier yeah, yeah. and just be, be, have have, a, have, a, have such a better time, just like walking down the street to my car. Yeah, you know, sunshine. And, but no, I had, to, I had to watch Red One. Yeah, you did, and I did that today as well. Uh, I, as you can see, we are, we have been separated by many many thousands of miles at this point, so we no longer see. Is that not true? How many miles Hundreds. is it? Hundreds? I don't, I don't really know how big space is, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, <laughs> many miles. So we no longer see movies together. Uh, and yeah. luckily, the movies that I've been seeing uh, up to this point while I've been uh, separated from Tanner, uh, I've had I've had the pleasure of, of bringing other people with me. I did not have the pleasure for Red One, and so I went to this movie by myself. Uh, and I almost went to it entirely by myself because there were I was in a massive 250-person IMAX screen, uh, and... There was like four other people in the movie theater with me. And that is, I would say, the worst way to see this movie. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. it's also the only way that you're ever going to see this movie. Because yeah. this is <laughs> yes. not a movie that... I, I, it's a movie that is so... It's made. It, it's a perfect example of a movie that's made for everyone and therefore ends up being for no one. Uh, and right. I... I can't say I didn't expect anything different, though. And I think that that's why I am not going to be, like, I'm not offended by this movie. I'm not going to be particularly aggressive towards it. It's like, that's what they marketed to me. I saw it. I felt the exact way I was. I expected to. And I came <laughs> out the other point. end just processing. It's interesting that this was made for the amount of money that it was with the stars that it was. And so I get to add it to my repertoire of things to pull some memes from. And I move on my merry way. Tanner, you might have been like, oh, man, I wish I could have walked out. I'm glad I sat. I'm glad I stayed. And now I get to move on with my life. That, Tucker, that's an interesting interesting perspective. Uh, and I can't say that I, I, I necessarily share that, but I understand where you're coming from. And I, I think I share some some of those sentiments in that, we, we, I mean, we should probably just sh you know shoot straight here. Uh, this movie sucks. It's hard. really, really bad. It's yeah. really bad really really bad um and we'll get into specifics about that but i like just like sort of uh generally co generally commiserating a little yeah. bit at the top Tanner here. loves doing a review he likes turning on the soft music lighting a couple yeah. candles you know lowering himself mm -hmm. slowly into the warm bath and then he's it's like this shit sucks <laughs> yeah it's review foreplay in a certain way absolutely um, so you come to backlog banter for the foreplay that's right <laughs> not the not the full act no. you know we do not Gosh. deliver in that regard and we never finish <laughs> That's why our videos are so long. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, Tucker, uh, your point about like what was sold to us. Yeah. Because obviously there was never a moment in time where I ever thought this movie was gonna be good. Mm -hmm. You know, from 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 the the earliest ideas to the trailers to the posters to the whatever. I was always set in my mind space of like this doesn't look very good. It looks, you know, boilerplate. It looks bottom of the barrel. I'm going to not have a good time with this. And we invoked the the term Stockholm syndrome at the top of this review. And I think it's interesting that um specifically 
pro- is films with Dwayne Johnson in sure. them. Dwayne the Rock Johnson, as yes. he's popularly. I known. was confused, but then you lit- you you uh, expounded. Yes. And I'm, and I'm no longer confused. his his Seven Bucks Productions, and there was a name that I recognized on this that is a a, a, a creative collaborator yeah. with Dwayne the Rock Jake Johnson, Kasten, uh, director. Oh yes, but there was there was a different name. Okay. One of the one of the other producers oh, okay, is like sure. oh, attached to a bunch of stuff with The Rock as well, yeah. um, and it's interesting that like the promise of The Rock, who is sort of this I guess the like idealized big time blockbuster movie star yeah. of our era, yeah, totally. has come to mean that these movies are nothing. They are gray paste mm-hmm. into a t- put into a tube and splurted out onto the masses for about yeah. two hours that will oftentimes make a lot of money even though that doesn't seem to be the case with red one yeah. and feel like they are not meant to you know sort of invoke the theatrical market as much as they are being mass appeal and having a have an, a, a life on streaming as mm-hmm. well this yeah. was of course i think initially set to go to amazon prime the Would streaming sense, service yeah. and then they moved it to a theatrical release mm-hmm. and it feels like that all this to say tucker is that i feel like we have been stockholm syndrome by dwayne the rock johnson and collaborators of his ilk to just not expect anything good from them and i don't know if that's a good expectation or ex- expectation we should hmm. be allowing to happen yeah yeah i mean i think <laughs> i think that's a great way to put it and the way that i'll expound on your gray paste thing is that it's a cinematic equivalent of of like <laughs> nutrition uh nutrition paste that they would eat in like a like a soylent green sort of thing where they, they yes. would eat that in like a sci-fi movie where <clears throat> it delivers on all the things that are necessary to create a movie. And I think that, that is maybe why I'm not going to be particularly harsh or offended by this film. I do think that ultimately all the points are there. Uh, and, and like, it doesn't... The story is an, is is an, a bland, but it, it has all the beats. I, as far as I can recall, there aren't particular giant jumps in logic. All the, the characters, for the most part, have like arcs. There, there's a point to this thing. It is a constructed film. And that is at a bare minimum. I'm not saying I'm not praising the movie mm-hmm. for that, but it has the building blocks, but it lacks any intrigue that sets itself apart from other things. And I think one thing I will actually disagree with you on, uh, as you were going in your tirade of from conception to idea to trailer to theater, you you mm-hmm. knew you were going to dislike this movie. I there's one element of this film that I do actually quite appreciate, which is the concept. I think the idea of this sort of militaristic uh, look at what the Santa Claus production timeline is, and the fact that he that they're they're like this hidden organization. It's got a sort of shield thing going on, and like, uh, in all honesty, this is the story that I would write about Santa Claus. Is like, oh, there's like this whole thing going on. It it's real, and there's this history behind it, and and he's actually like thousands of years old, and and people are keeping it secret. I I like it in concept, but then when you force it into the the rock cinematic mold that's when it loses all the intrigue that that could potentially have sure and i i I think it's because when i say you know the 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 very announcement of this film it was because it was announced like it's going to have the rock it's going to be directed by jake cast and i was like i know exactly what this movie is going to be totally totally even with if if this idea was done by like james gunn and there was like a wacky tinge to it and it had this like universe behind it i think the idea is solid but you're right that the The, the the idea is also (laughs) <laughs> uh, the idea is also not original, I would mm. say. Uh, people have pointed this out that there is a film. I mean, it's crazy that they beat they got beat to this by like a decade plus. Yeah. I mean, there's this animated movie called Arthur, Arthur Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, That's yeah. the exact same thing. Where it's well, even that movie is about like the son of Santa Claus mm. who eventually has to take over. But the militarized factual basis yeah, of like, totally. well, feasibly, what sort of fantasy uh, explanations could we give to the Santa Claus mythos to explain all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, and even like uh, the Santa Claus, the Disney oh, films sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. have this sort of like secret society of you know mythical creatures totally. that come together yeah. uh, for their holidays or whatever. Um, Tucker, should, you, should we just bite the bullet and get into talking about totally. the film Red One? Yeah, absolutely. I want you to start, Tanner, with okay. the one thing that you messaged me about this film before we started recording, which is 
you've got a, some way to describe how Jack O'Malley, uh, Chris Evans' yes. character, who we actually have not even mentioned yet at all, no. um, because this does feel more like a rock production that, that just happens to feature Chris Evans, even though he's the protagonist, he is the main character. Um, yeah, but it, it's you know it's it's a seven bucks production. Sure. Yeah, it's not a Chris Evans doesn't actually have a production company as far as I'm I don't aware. think so. Uh, but how does he talk? And why does okay, this Tucker. So apparently and this is a collaborative is so effort here. <laughs> this is a collaborative effort okay. here. So I, Tucker, I'm just gonna need you to kind of say something from the movie. It, it, like, it, say, That's gonna be really hard. Say something hard. that like Lucy Liu or Dwayne Johnson okay, would say right. uh, uh, about like the world that the film exists in. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I can just remember some stuff from the trailers. Um, uh-huh. uh, well, I can do. Uh, Red one has been captured. You're telling me Red One has been captured? Uh, Here, hit, 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 hit me with another one, Tucker. Hit me with another one. Uh, toy shops are, are portals for the Santa Claus uh, system. Wait, what the shit? Hold on a second. You're telling me that toy shops are, are a portal for the Santa Claus system? Yeah. He, it is infuriating how Chris Evans, his character, or how he is written in this. Holy because shit. I literally, it, God forbid I ever rewatch this movie, and God forbid that uh, you you go to see this after watching this review. But like, if you do, you know this will be on streaming probably around Christmas time. Yeah. Gather the family around, get a nice big bottle of vodka, get some shot glasses, take a shot every time a character says something, and then Chris Evans immediately parrots exactly what they just said, but with like a what what's going on here yeah. kind of intonation. It is literally there are so many examples in this and it's so lazy it's lazy comedic writing yeah, it's yeah. lazy fantasy writing it is just like, like i was saying bottom of the barrel like well how would this character be written i mean he's skeptical about all this well how would we convey that well why don't he why doesn't he just parrot everything mm-hmm. dwayne johnson or lucy Liu yeah. or jk simmons says with like a oh well i'm out of my depth here boy <laughs> you know what tanner i in retrospect, you're totally right. And by by in retrospect, I mean thinking back, yeah, absolutely, that's exactly what happened. And and it's helping to clarify exactly what I think doesn't work about this movie because, again, I, I do like the base level concept of it. I think it's Jack O'Malley. I think that mm. the writing of that character, him being this fish out of water, is the element of it that feels the most stock standard of we have this world that – is based on other things, and you can say there's it's drawing some inspiration from Men in Black, it's drawing inspiration from like Avengers and Shield sort of things. Mm-hmm. But it is it's a it's a crafted world. There's a history here. There's there's these societies and stuff. It's like okay, that's a, 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 at some level kind of interesting, and th- there was effort put into creating this. And then you put this guy in it that he he is the fish out of water. That's what you usually do in these scenarios. But yeah. If <laughs> if we didn't have him. I think that this movie would just work a lot more because I think everyone else plays into their roles. They, it's the, everyone else is pretty self serious, all things considered, and they, and they they fill their roles that are in this larger eco- ecosystem of the Santa Claus system. But then there's Jack O'Malley, who is a largely unlikable character that is delivering lines that, for the most part, don't move the like plot forward. He's just kind of there. Because he's a good tracker, but also that's no, not even think, true. Like here's here's no. here's the <laughs> yeah. It, God, it's becoming even more clear the more I think about this. The problem is Jack O'Malley because he's taken by the, the system to help them find Red One to find Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I actually really can't remember a single instance of him actually helping them using his skills. There isn't skills. one. Because, Tucker, because there he doesn't isn't know anything one. about the system. Like, he doesn't no. know that the, the portals are things. He doesn't know about Krampus. He doesn't know about about the, the the North Pole and the way that people have to communicate using these like little communicators and stuff. That's not his thing. And so it's it's Callum Drift, Dwayne Johnson's character, that is just basically dragging Jack O'Malley around for the two-hour runtime of this film. He isn't actually useful. His skill set is is so jankily pried into the, you know, the plot turning points of this film that you can feel the, I don't, you can feel the sweat rolling off of the writers as they try to be like, well, he's a tracker, so like, well, he has to contribute something to this whole story. Um, I don't know, this, like, the scene, whether at the fucking, the, the piano on the road, I think it is. Yeah. 
Um, and he's like, well, what would you normally do? And he's like, well, normally I'd look for, like, credit card transactions or whatever. And they're like, well, what about this tracker thingy that we have on Santa or something? I don't fucking know because this movie is so bland and nothing and forgettable that I have justly forgotten a lot of the important material from it yeah. in uh, less than 24 hours mm-hmm. having after having seen the film. Yeah. I, I, I think that's totally fair, and I think... That uh, the pacing of this movie is another thing that is very stock standard. The interesting thing is, this movie is actually made up of a bunch of just long scenes. I mean, this is a high octane movie at surface level. There are fight sequences, there are action moments, there are there are the loud strings playing over something CGI laden happening on screen. But mm-hmm. any given sequence that you can think of of this film lasts a full 10 15 minutes and i think that that also makes it feel like a very slow movie and also frankly kind of defeats the purpose of the tension that is intended to be set from the get-go of santa claus has been kidnapped we have 24 hours to do this usually that would contribute to some sort of momentum of the clock is ticking but there are many scenes where they just kind of sit around and talk and i'm like guys i know you're like trying to get to know one another but there's more important shit to do and it's really bizarre to watch these scenes just kind of go on and on and on and they they go to the beach and they wander around and they look at some guys and then there's a fight that goes on forever and they're like all right we gotta go to krampus and then we gotta get into krampus's castle and then we go to the dungeon mm-hmm. and then we do the fight and then we do the escape and i'm like each of these scenes is like a six-step process when frankly i think for the tension of the film to really feel like it has some sort of stakes, I would have wanted them to there to be. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what I'm gonna how I'm gonna really fix Red One because I think it's got so many ground level issues. But I, I think more shorter scenes with a wider variety of a look into what this world is that also maybe, frankly, develop some of the characters a little bit further. I think would have gone a long way into making this feel like something that had a sense of momentum because as it stands it's just you're dropped into a sequence that they kind of just stumble into like like a lot for most of the scenes i can't remember why they went to this place (laughs) yeah uh, it it is a device the whole film as many of the rock's recent projects have been are just ham-fisted and overly long attempts to convince you that he is charming Mm. And charismatic. I would disagree with this film, though. Because Red One, his character, Callum Drift... (laughs) My problem with the movie is Jack O'Malley. But another Uh problem with the movie is Callum Drift. Because Callum Drift has no personality. He has well, his, no this, goals. Well, this is my thing, though. It's, it's a, it is a poor execution uh, sure. of that okay. also. Yeah, yeah. But, like, that is kind of The Rock's uh, uh, brand. He has, he has two different kinds of brands. He has, like, the, the, the Maui brand where he's, like, you know, he where he's, like, the fun-loving guy. Yeah. And then he has, like, his more serious action brand where he's, like, stern-faced, doing the people's eyebrow. Yeah. He's like, I'm not taking no guff from nobody, and I'll beat your ass because I'm the biggest guy in town. Like, that is the mode that he's operating in here. Kind of, but he also is a more just, like, he's a more centered guy in this movie. Like, Callum Drift is, is a no-nonsense guy. He has a good grasp of what's going on, but he's not aggressive. He's... St- firm but yeah and, and, I, and i say this as a negative because it does mean that he doesn't feel like he has any particular presence other than the big menacing guy and especially all of this comes back around when you when the movie finishes and you realize i have no fucking idea who this guy is i don't know mm-hmm. why he's here well Tucker, he was he was just getting so depressed because he um because like he couldn't see christmas joy or like people's inner child i guess was the is like the one of the final oh, shots is I, that yeah. he sees he but, sees chris <laughs> evans like shrunk down to a boy yeah. his he, he doesn't have a goal actually he kind of has the opposite of a goal which is he doesn't know what he needs to do with his life. He's, yeah. he's tired of what he's been doing. And so I guess his arc is is finding <laughs> the spirit of Christmas or whatever. Uh, and then being happy, being by Santa's side again. But what I meant by we don't know who this guy is, is literally, what's his history? Who, who, what, how does he know Santa Claus? How, how did he become the second in command? Tucker? Why does he have what these abilities? Is that he he? Have? Yeah, he's not human, as he said. He's been around for hundreds of years. And... 
he and Santa Claus both have Ant-Man powers, which was not shown in the marketing at all. And when no. it happens for the first time on the beach sequence, and you just see this funny little Oscar statue-sized Dwayne Johnson on the beach, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> How Wait, and is why? It, is, it, is it an inherent ability, or is it like a piece of tech that they have? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it does not matter, ultimately. <laughs> uh, oh, God. Um, um... So I think they're also trying to do to your point about like liking the concept about this and like the secret society of mythical creatures. Yeah, I think they're also trying to in ideally set up like spin-offs for this. You know, Maybe. they they're because they, they're like had this horseman exist. Yeah. So like Halloween stuff and other like other myths of that nature yeah. that happen. Um, oh yeah, actually, no, no, we should talk about uh, like the antagonist is probably an important sure. thing to talk about here, uh, whose name is. Gryla, Correct. Um, played by Kiernan Shipka. Uh, she is a Christmas witch. Uh, she is hundreds of years old. Um, and her goal is to take everyone on the naughty list and trap them in snow globes. As punishment. As punishment because they're on the naughty list. Yeah. Um, and... At the end of the movie, she invades the North Pole. Uh, also, Santa's been trapped at the North Pole the whole time. Like, yeah. they didn't know that, but he's just been trapped there. And also, everyone at the North Pole has been, like, taken over by uh, Gryla's, like, shape-shifting sons. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, but you know what's funny about the twist that, that Nick has been at the uh, North Pole the entire time? What's funny about that is that, again, in retrospect, it makes you realize Jack O'Malley's fucking useless. Because yes. if he was good <laughs> yes. at his job, they would have known that from the fucking beginning. So the fact that they set up this whole thing about how he can find anyone that no one else can, mm-hmm. um, I don't, I don't see that in the movie. <laughs> yeah, also that's not how he's introduced. He's like a heist guy at the beginning of the movie. He can find any data that no, anyone else can. I don't know, because <laughs> it's also like Tanner, Tanner, movie. I don't know if you remember the opening scene of this film is at a nice Christmas party in the yeah. 80s. Or something like that, where he's a oh, kid yeah. and he finds the presents in the closet because he can find stuff that no one else can. That's right. Um, God, this movie's so fucking stupid and infuriating yeah. to me. It's so it's so nothing. I hate it. Um, there was uh, there was uh, Nick Kroll is in this for a little bit. Um, uh, let's see what else. Uh, talk, I mean, do you have anything? Do you have anything else in, in Red One that you want to talk about? I'm I'm sort of like floundering. Oh, I'm at a loss here. Know, there's one major element of this film that uh, okay. contributes to its identity as a major motion picture in the sort of classic, uh-huh. modern classic Hollywood sense of it's got a bunch of effects and it's just big and loud yeah, and there's okay. characters everywhere. And this is the part where the movie is at its and I'm going to use this very lightly, it's okay. most obnoxious and it's also it's most impressive because mm. there are, and to the impressive part, I think that the most technically impressive part of the movie is the sequence in Krampus's lair or whatever. Oh, Because yes. there Thank is for, for a 60 fucking Bith Band motherfucker characters, fucking Moss Eisley Cantina <laughs> motherfuckers. Just like, what did you call them? The Bith Band, the fucking, uh, the, the Star Wars Cantina band players. The oh, okay, okay. Moss okay. Eisley Cantina looking ass guys yeah, yeah, yeah. that are just all sorts of crazy characters and most of it's practical effects that look most of it really is practical. good. <laughs> and yeah, so I'm just I like agree. looking at all these characters I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's kind of awesome, actually. That that Krampus fucking look is is sick. It, it's real. It, listen, the practical effects on him are really good. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine that that was particularly cheap, but I can also can't imagine that cost uh, a good chunk of that two hundred and fifty yeah. million dollars. And the rest of this movie certainly does not live up to that sort of that sort of idea yeah. of or or level of production. And so. As opposed to being like the a great sequence in this movie, um, I cynically maybe sort of look at it as, well, look what, what could is have this? Had. Yeah, what what, what could have been? Like, yeah. why is this the one sticking out like a sore thumb sequence in the entire movie where things feel I don't know, comparatively at least more tactile yeah, totally. and real and like crafted with some sort of intentionality or mm-hmm. care as opposed to quick cutting rubbery 
comp, you know, loosely comped in CGI stuff that's either on a beach that's clearly like a a back lot in Atlanta or that, that, that's just <laughs> nothing that exists. This movie is full because we we get the positives out of the way. This sequence is cool. There's a lot of good looking guys and a ve- like huge amount of variety, which yeah. is what really yeah. impressed me. Just like like. Almost every character in the background is like a totally unique like species or whatever, and I'm like, whoa, you didn't mm-hmm. need to go that hard, Jesus Christ! Um, but that again, it sticks out as a sore thumb because every other sequence of this movie is the most they were not there CGI ass sequences I've ever seen in my life. And the mm-hmm. amount of green screen kind of maybe like uh, like pickup shot kind of like we're just trying to craft this together in post. Um, sequences I've seen where characters are not in frame together, the lighting is wrong, and the, this movie's biggest, biggest, like a more objective flaw, that's not just me being annoyed with it, I think is the very clearly expensive and I think very poorly done, ultimately at the end of the day, yeah. spe- special effects of this movie. Because it's, I think this is the blurriest special effects I've ever seen in my life. Every sequence yeah. in which there are things happening in the background or or Callum Jeff is sliding down a thing or, or punching the, the snowman on the beach and like all this stuff. It's like, it is so not real. It is, it is because when those things are on screen, the screen isn't clear. Like, I'm like, okay, I know what Dwayne Johnson's supposed to look like. I'm seeing him in shots in this movie where he's standing mm-hmm. in a fucking mall or whatever. I'm like, okay, that's Dwayne Johnson. He's in a place. And then you put him against whatever insert CGI character here and suddenly he becomes slightly blurrier too because they're like trying to match all this stuff together. I'm like, oh my god! I, I really think that the the blurry special effects of this movie are the worst aspect of it on like objective level. And it's not even that stuff that only looks bad. You when at the beginning of the movie, you know, obviously we 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 were out of the sequence in the '80s Christmas party or whatever. When Ma, you know, adult Jack O'Malley is introduced in his his initial heist oh, thing. Oh fuck! I was dude. just the watching it. And I was like, Jesus! I was watching it, and I was like, this looks like charitably to be nice to this movie, like. A 2000s Disney yep. TV comedy. Absolutely. 100%. Like a, TV, like a Disney TV movie. And this is and the moment. And that's being nice. This is like, the moment where I really realized that this, to me, feels like a streaming movie in the most uh, cynical and, frankly, uh, <laughs> offensive or derogatory way I can mean that. Um, mm-hmm. I have been trying over the last year to sort of push back on my distaste for streaming films because it's a big part of the industry. I feel like I need to... Uh, adapt myself to it a little bit more so I'm not just an old man yelling at clouds but I do mm. think that there is this stigma that I have towards the sort of TV movie look and the shallow depth of field and the flat lighting and things that of course exist in in theatrically released films and this is hey, a theatrical as seen here yeah well yes but I mean <laughs> more being made well. by yeah. Amazon and the mm-hmm. intent of an Amazon production, actually, I think this can be also drawn to something like Argyle, which we saw earlier this year, where mm-hmm. these elements aren't that important to be impressive on the big screen or well done because they're not necessarily meant in the long term to be watched on the big screen. And so I'm watching this. I'm like, you, people watch these kind of movies not only on streaming but on, on TV movies and also a lot of TV shows look like this. Um, actually, it's interesting. In, in, in an opposite way, I would say – streaming shows in the like more high budget high production value sense that we kind of know them as now are the more impressive things that are on streaming like tv shows went from oh these are the sort of cheapy like ser- like serialized things to like oh we're we're uh, uh, insert the, the the bear the penguin uh, whatever high production yeah, i mean value it's show. The, the the advent of like prestige tv yeah. uh has been you know in the streaming era has has been much more successful in elevating like yeah. good craft yeah, totally. than streaming movies have for Absolutely. example but by and large of course there are streaming yeah, movies 100%. that look good there are tv shows that look bad etc yeah yeah um so yeah so i think that that is i i mean this in the worst possible way this looks like a streaming movie and this movie will mm-hmm. it is intended for streaming and that's just frustrating um i i give minor props minor props for them putting this out theatrically i mean just i would rather even the most dumb shit streaming movies get put out into theaters to help the theatrical market help get people back into theaters um i just think it makes the market more interesting um but this is a bad movie 
and I hope it doesn't do well on streaming because that would be just a sign of the times, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how to slice the like feeling more broadly that I that I have around this that we talked about uh, uh, for a little bit at the top of the review here, but. I don't know. There, There is just something to, like, this kind of movie yeah. that is becoming, that has become very prevalent and is hopefully on its way out yeah. as the, as general audiences seem to roundly reject them. Mm-hmm. You know, this $250 movie is looking to open to $30 million and will flop hard next week when we get, uh, you know, at least some movies that people are, you know, chattering about more totally. in Gladiator 2 and Wicked. Yeah. Um, and I seem to have a, a, a bit more of craft or at least care to them. You know, people have derided the way that Wicked looks, and I I, I, I also happen to think that that movie doesn't, doesn't look particularly good. Mm-hmm. But at the very least, I feel like those films and many others, the people who made them care, and with I, I keep haranguing The Rock on this, but... I feel like he is is kind of uh, suspect number numero uno in this. It started. It, 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 it's just frustrating to me how much it feels like he does not care about the quality of these things that he's in. He is the movie star of, of movie stars essentially for our time, and he is regularly delivering subpar, no effort, yep. boring, yep. dull, gray films to us and collaborating with creators directors writers whatever who do not care about crafting interesting yeah. stories or films that feel like they have you know intentionality in the way that they look or feel or sound or anything that has to yeah. do with the film and craft it feels like that's just all going out the window in the name of i don't know making a movie mm-hmm. but there's a little bit more that goes into making a movie than just well, The Rock's in it, so it's going to do well. Yeah. Or The Rock is in it, so people will go to see it. Mm. It is, a, it is like, a, if essentially to me, it feels like an insult to the audience that they're like, well, they'll go to see this, right? We don't have to but try Apparently too hard. not, which I think is the thing that like gives me some solace. Uh, this is going to be a yeah. movie that's just a joke. It's going to be a massive money loser. It's not going to be popular on streaming. Argyle didn't like become a big thing on streaming just because it had stars. It was a bad movie. It got bad reviews, and therefore, people didn't see it. It's, uh, the same thing's gonna happen here. And I, uh, thank you to the to the world, mm-hmm. to the general populace. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But also, they're not. Go- Sometimes they don't go to see good movies either. Sure. So you know, the, the the general audience is a fickle mistress, yes, isn't it? Absolutely. But thank you very much, everyone, for watching our oh, review. Talk about scores. Oh, uh, yeah. This is like a this is a this is a two point seven out of ten. I'm going to go 2 out of 10. 2 out of 10. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I was just trying to get myself out of here. I know. <laughs> can't, can't take any more of this shit. Uh, well, Tanner, did we mm-hmm. just save Christmas? I think we just saved Christmas. Christmas.